Good morning and welcome to Reimagining Talent. I'm Christine Nicholas and good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Thank you for getting up early. Shout out to Lisa, shout out to Josna and all of our other friends on the West Coast. I'm so happy today to be here with Jess Oberto, our Director of Process Engineering. There's Jess. Hi. She keeps us honest. She keeps us on time. She's the go-to person. She's also going to be watching Q&A for us. If you're new to our webinars, yeah, it's been a minute. So it's been a couple of months. There's been so much going on um, here at People Science and really in the world of work that I thought it was important to take a step back. And during that step back time, of course, we were in the uh, conference season, which made it great to meet people. And one of the people that I met just a few months ago is Johann Zeitzman. What a what a great meeting it's been and, and what a pleasure it's been to get to know you. I mean, Johan has uh, really given me a different perspective on things. So I'm going to give you, uh, our viewers, a quick overview. But Johan comes to us originally, he's been in the HR space since 94 and started in his native uh, land of South Africa. Uh, and some of the things that have been explained to me from your perspective, I think, are so relevant today, right? Because you've lived in this constant state of change from an HR perspective for a long time. And that's exactly where we are. So thank you for joining us today, Johan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. And we're going to get to the meat and potatoes in just a second. So we've changed the format a bit about Reimagine because if you follow us, you know that we really, um, at People Science, and we've dedicated our 25 years um, in the talent world saying, how do you make talent acquisition better? How do we retain our employees? And how do we uplift the workforce? And it's you know, I'd like to say it's the perfect storm, but it's more like the perfect universe. There's so many different factors that are coming to play, and there's a lot of noise out there. There is, uh, I mean, just this morning, some of the articles that we'll talk about in a second that came out, and so many different viewpoints out there. So how do we, as talent professionals, weather these storms and really capitalize on this information? The time is now. I mean, so many of us, you'll hear Sherm get behind this, HCI get behind this. All of us in human resources say, still saying, how do we get to the table? Um, and it is remarkable to me in these times that we are seeing the C-suite gravitate towards a better understanding of the, of the shift in power that's taking place and all the other variables that are affecting our world of work and how we tie that back to business. So the, moving forward in our monthly reimagined series, we'll talk about some of those. The highlights for today are going to be um, looking at, at some of the uh, the world of AI and how that's affecting us, right? Onshore and offshore production, which is one of the first articles that I picked up this morning. Work from home, remote work and hybrid work. How is that working? Um, and Johan and I are kind of maybe a different different uh, perspectives on that. That's going to be an interesting conversation. We'll also talk about the employee-employee power relationship and how that's changing um, and where it's going and also inclusion. I think the most interesting thing for me as I was preparing for this webinar over the last couple of weeks has been how connected all of these things are. So when we look at AI, how is that affecting inclusion? How is that going to affect the power shift? All of these things are so connected. And I think we tend to, the media tends to advertise them in isolation with big metrics that are relative to a study or two studies. Um, so what we're going to try and always do through reimagining through this webinar series is Take a look at those stats, yeah, but talk about the practicalities and then the hacks that we've, we've either used at People Science or some of our customers or potential clients or networks have used. Um, and we'd also like to hear back from you. So let's start off by just taking a look at where we are today in the world of work. Right now, um, as of last month, there was 1.6 jobs available for every person on unemployment. That's down a little bit. Coming into the turn of the year, we were at almost two. Um, so we are seeing this gradual Closing of the gap, but it's really a tiny close, right? And no one, none of us is predicting that that's going to be a significant change. Even if we were to lay off considerably, even if we were to have the largest layoff in U.S. history, we would still be running way far behind as far as our talent gap is concerned. Uh, so let's start out, Johan, by talking about AI. Uh, I know you and I have had a lot of conversations around that. And there's, um, I don't know if you guys know this, that or not, but this is pretty staggering. There were 100 million users of chat CPI or GPT in the first two months that it launched. 
So oh. to put that, in, yeah, right. Wow. And if you put that, in, if you put that in contact, in context, and apply it to social media, TikTok took nine months to get a hundred million subscribers. So a hundred million people. I don't know. Is it fear of missing out? Yeah, I think so it's very unique, Christine. It's not a question just of fear of missing out. It's, um, you know, I started dabbling myself a little bit, and I don't know how many of our listeners has has been in there to look at the use cases. It is just incredibly valuable as an augment, um, you know, to to my day job. And you know, the use cases are immense. It's uh, it's something I really, I really see a lot of value in. And if I see something that makes me more effective as a professional, I'm going to use it. So. I find a little bit more value in chat GPT than TikTok personally. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's probably why I was one of those, uh, one of those numbers. Well, yeah. And hopefully a lot of that, of those hundred million people that jumped on board were um, in the business world. I mean, I, I think we're certainly seeing that and we're seeing a lot of shakeout when it comes to um, companies. So I, I, when I say a lot of, or position, when I say a, a, a lot of it, I think marketing in particular has, a lot of hits in that arena, but I, I was talking two weeks ago with an insurance company and they laid off 45% of their risk department based on a tool that it took them three days to implement, an AI tool that it took them three days to implement. So when we look at where is AI making the biggest impact, right? So we know it's going to have a big impact when it comes to the world of work, I think understanding the businesses we support and also, especially big tech, we've seen a big pullback on hiring and hiring plans because we simply don't know and they don't know, most organizations don't know what the impact, the full impact of AI is going to be on their products, the products they create, products that they already have. So I think some of the stall that we saw up until last week in hiring, because we have seen that shift, has been this kind of deer in the headlight. So from your perspective, are you hearing or seeing anything similar to that? Well, um, I think it's different in different companies. And certainly the the uh, example you use is an extreme one. I don't anticipate seeing too many of those myself. That's just my perspective. But, um, you know, if you think of frontline workers and you think about automation that's happened as part of the manufacturing processes, that's been with us for many, many years already, right? And you look just at the automotive industry and, you know, how much uh, automation was introduced there in the last couple of um, of decades. Immense, right? And I just think uh, chat GPT and these uh, language models, it's, uh, it's the turn of the knowledge work, right? So we are now getting tools and opportunities to to automate routine repetitive type tasks, right? So, so, so for me personally, as a, you know, I'm from South Africa, so uh, uh, English is my second language, uh, Afrikaans being my first. Um, you know, it take it took it takes me a long time to like write communications, just as an example. And my wife always, you know, she thinks I'm better than her as an example, which may not always be the case. So for her to come up with an email out to somebody. It takes a lot of time, right? It takes some thinking time, reflection time. You write something and then you edit it again. Um, with ChatGPT, there's there's a way I can write a prompt. Hey, write me an email that covers these points. Boom, in seconds, I have something in front of me that I can review and edit, right? I still want that to sound like me. And immediately I saved half an hour of my time of writing an important email. I've used that for communications, I've used that for presentations, I've used it for contracting language and SOWs, I've used it for um, thank you notes to, uh, you know, uh, employees and neighbors, um, you know, so so just a simple use case like that, um, you know, the critical thinking, the innovation, the purpose, the, um, the human connection, um, that you cannot automate, that's just what makes us human, right? But those sort of more menial things, I found personally a lot of value in that. And here's another example, actually. Um, we just ran an employee survey. And we, you know, as part of our continuous engagement activities. And uh, we developed our own internal version of ChatGPT that, you know, protects us and you know, keeps our information safe. And we said to this, uh, to this tool, hey, analyze these comments. And give us the top five sentiments, the lowest, five sentiments, uh, think about a communication, 
you know, that goes out to employees to thank them for their participation, touching on these inclusive elements or these areas. And it just gave us something really, really good as a starting point, right? It's not the be all and end all, but it just set us off in a direction which we can then build on. And then we had a little bit of fun of it and said, well, do it in the style of Bob Dylan as an example. And then we just were having each other with a laugh. And so, you know, it's really a very, very powerful tool uh, from my perspective. And I can see many, 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 many use cases that augments our critical thinking and creativity, creative uh, uh, skills, right? And I don't think you can automate that yet. I don't know. I, I, I'm skeptical, at least in the near future. <laughs> Well, we agree on the fact that it's a good tool, right? Yeah. I don't think we know what the effects are fully yet. I can I can tell you the industries. So um, I happen I happen to be a part of of a network that it examines different startups, and that our group is completely dedicated to AI, and that group's been around for about a year and a half. All of the startups that we're working with are really focused on big data. So AI having the largest impact in finance, in banking, because where is the data stored, right? Insurance, things like doing predictive and risk management. And, you know, we've worked with, with uh, and, and Jess, right? So we've worked with, with several insurance company startups and fintechs that had really good algorithms. But what took them maybe two years to develop um, can take less than a day or so based on the newer technologies and protocols that have been released. So I think when when we think where are we seeing the biggest impact, it's certainly going to be in that banking, finance, and pharma um, because of the amount of data. Any organization that has large data and base their business models on large data are going to see a lot of changes there. So change is not meeting necessarily, like, right? But just to change to the way. And I think the point that you made the other day was, right? So, so you lay off here, you're still going to need AI people, right? Like. Yeah, I think there's an example I heard in a in a TED talk once about a um, what is it a dry you know in the automotive industry a job that nobody could imagine have existed 20 years ago, which was about an, a driver experience uh, engineer right, which is all about thinking about the cognitive processes of driving and how that interacts with computers and technology. Right, so that is a totally new skill that nobody predicted 20 years ago would be needed. And you'll see the same thing happening um, you know, um, outside of that space. Um, so um, are there gonna be less jobs? I don't think it's gonna be as bad as we would predict. I think the skill sets are gonna change, right? And we live in the VUCA world uh, where things are, are continuing to change at the, you know, the change of, uh, or pace of change we're experiencing right now is the slowest it's gonna be. Uh, from here on in, here on in, uh, and I just expect the uh, the transformational impact that these type of tools are going to make in how we work and how we engage. Um, from my perspective, you know, that's going to you know it's probably as big as when you know computers got into a workplace and we moved away from faxes and those things, which I did experience, um, you know, in those early days of my career doing holiday jobs. Um, uh, it was a transformational impact. I think the same. We can expect the same from from AI and, and how we partner together as a collective more efficiently. And Christine, I think we spoke about this a little bit before. Um, you know, you're talking about 1.6 jobs for every uh, unemployed person. So if every unemployed person in the U.S. got a job right now, there'd still be four million unfilled roles. Right? If you look mm -hmm. at the next year. so we don't have enough people to do the jobs that's available. Right. So in that sense, if you think about higher productivity, you know, that augmenting of AI with, with the human capability, I think it's a saving grace for us in you know war of talent and you know the skill shortage and the labor shortage we've we've been facing. And it's about embracing that. And you know, early adopters uh, you know often benefit from changes. So um, you know, that's just the way I look at you know at uh, at what we're faced with. Early adopters do. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. And I think without, I think we desperately need AI to help us really change the work so that we use tools that are the most effective. And then we use our intellect as, as individuals separately, but join forces, right? Yeah. On that note, this I don't know if anybody saw this this morning. It came out this morning, but this is 
Biden's $52 million bet on chips has a big problem. The American semiconductor firms take twice as long to hire as anyone else. Hmm. So I know um, before before we jump to this topic, which really is what's going on with manufacturing, onshoring, protected, protectivism throughout the world and how that's affecting our work life. Uh, and it's always surprising to me how these things connect. I mean, you can go to the deli down the street who's going to be affected by the semiconductors that aren't automated enough or there aren't enough candidates um, to fill those jobs and bubble that all the way up to the government. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that that we need to really concentrate on as talent professionals is how is that, kept, you know, how do you look at it from the from the bird's eye view? But just going back to the AI, I want to make sure I give you guys some of the hacks that we found that have been pretty effective. There are uh, a myriad of different technologies out there uh, in the talent world that capitalize on AI. Of the and you know, I every other Tuesday I sit down with our IT group and anybody at People Science and our customers also will bubble up new technology and say, "Can you investigate this?" It's all HR technology or relevant to HR check. Ninety um, percent of it still doesn't work. That's where we are right now. But the ones that do work are awesome. They're, I'm not even going to say an eighth of the price. You know, when we talk about different applicant tracking systems, right? So we didn't have applicant tracking systems arguably until like Kaleo came on the market, right? And that was this big self-contained system. Then we saw the ATS world get shaken up when Workday or the HRIS system, the first, you know, web-based HRIS system Workday, right? Which was created from, from the people from um, people soft that came from IBM, right? Um, but today, when we look at what's going on in the AI world, the price of applicant tracking systems and HRIS systems is dropping considerably while their optimization is even higher. So I think we're going to see a shift in HR technology that's pretty significant around those things and around the way our HR technology or HRIS systems um, interface is going to be important. So moving forward, I would definitely take a look at that because some of these technologies have really had us questioning, do you really need this big box solution at this point when this is faster? Uh, case in point, we have a technology higher gate here um, and we were prompted when being evaluated as a, a new technology that we're bringing to the market. And one of uh, the observers said to us, look, can you search on these particular features and, and get that done? Took that back and within 24 hours, our IT group was able to use AI to institute that. And to get, put this in perspective, it's saving our recruiters about 11 hours a week in sourcing. That's that's huge. I mean, Johan, you were just saying how much it shortened your time to do a really good email, right? Or really good correspondence. Look at how this game is changing. You need to participate. I mean, we're all looking at budgets all the time, right? But also, you, you've got to be smart. So the hacks are out there. Um, and we're going to talk about assessments in a few minutes, too. But that's some of the pieces that we've seen. Um, so on that note, I'm going to jump to the tail end instead of the front end, because we did just kind of talk about this $52 billion article. This is in Fortune this morning, like I said. I, You know, the headlines are always like, oh, right? We all kind of catch our breath. Oh, my gosh, do I have to go change everything today? Uh, Caution, Will Robinson, do not change anything yet. I mean, I think always trying to look at the source, not just the periodical. So in this case, not just Fortune, but where is the data coming from? The data in this article looks looks to me like it's it's pretty rational. Um, whether or not it's it's still predictive on how difficult things are, but we do live in this world. I mean, if China, if we have this relationship between China and Russia that's taking place which is just, you know, propagating more of this protectivism, how much more, and I know that Church and Dwight is global and you're a global person. How, how do you see that going in the world of employment as far as, you know, not being able to maybe have as much um, of our manufacturing being done offshore and outsourcing, which of course we can, you know, not even outsourcing, but hiring globally. Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Having lived in all these volatile different areas. Yeah, and you're not commenting on on China and Russia because we, um, you know, we certainly have an office in in China, and, you know, really um, a fantastically productive office for us there. Um, you know, what we experienced at COVID, and I think uh, all of us that had manufacturing uh, operations during that time had a 
had a great time keeping things going is um, the reliability of supply chains just a minute. So I'm not going to pro proclaim myself as a supply chain expert, but you know, this is just my perspective. And, and we had uh, you know boats stuck in the Suez Canal that disrupted the global supply chain and et cetera. There was just all these really interesting things that happened that that made us think as a company about um, manufacturing closer to the source and and shortening the supply chains and where we get raw materials from, et cetera. Um, to remove risk from the supply chain. And I heard early on, um, you know, um, we we had a, a just-in-time approach around how we do uh, supply chain because everything was working so well to, to now moving, you know, into more contingency. And, and as a company, actually, um, you know, we've we've increased um, our headcount since the uh, beginning of COVID by about 12.5%. And you've seen multiple investments in additional lines, um, you know, production capability in the U.S. And of course, that at the same time put a lot of pressure on, uh, you know, uh, on the HR uh, team and the talent acquisition team to find folks. And I could tell you we're in a very different world from, uh, from a talent acquisition perspective than, than pre-COVID. And, and there's, I think, many, um, many factors. And, you know, I'm not sharing anything that's, uh, you know, colleagues on, on the line hasn't experienced themselves. But that has really necessitated us to think very differently about how we how we hire people, how we use technology. And one of the things we focused on very much was shortening the recruitment uh, timeline, right? So from the first touch with a, with a candidate to, to offer background check, you know, the things we check in background to just decrease that cycle. Because uh, folks keep on shopping for that next uh, sign-on bonus. And, you know, if while well, you have a captive audience, um, you know, you have to move really quickly uh, to get convert that candidate into a, um, uh, you know, into a full time employee. And it's worked well for us. I think, uh, you know, some of the technology investments and we did use a, a bit of AI in, in, in that front end, uh, like you've seen many other business cases uh, around how you use technology to do, you know, uh, screening questions for that screening process to get them to interview. There is a lot of really great tools out there that folks could use. But even, you know, and I know I'm. Uh, perhaps going off topic a little bit, but even in terms of our employer branding strategy and, and how we, we, we connect with prospective candidates, how we find them, how we use uh, technologies to text them around certain things. And, you know, we've, we've got a whole mix of old school billboards and flyers off to uh, using, um, you know, geolocation, do targeting, targeted ads on, you know, Google, you know, search engine optimization. It's just a whole array of, um, of of tools and technologies we're using to reach that prospective candidate and to find them. And these are all things that we had to adopt very quickly. Uh, we had a great recruiting practice before COVID, but we had to sharpen our pencils and and become uh, even tighter in the use of technology and connecting with the uh, with the prospective candidate. It's just at a different level, and that all is because we have brought much more of. Uh, uh, we increased our U.S. Uh, supply chain capacity, but the same can be said about being closer to the source for our businesses in Asia. So there, for co-manufacturing, uh, you know, co-mans, um, you know, we've we trying to just get the manufacturing happening as close to where the you know the end uh, end of that uh, supply chain is, so we can eliminate some of the shipping challenges, etc., that we've uh, uh, experienced during COVID. So having that, you know, not being waylaid by the fact that we're going into an election year, there's a lot of, you know, we have the Ukraine war, we have all this protection, you know, separating our organization. And I have to say from a personal perspective, I've always thought that business leads the way, regardless of politics, and not choosing any side. Like you said, you know, if, if your operations are in China, and we happen to have done some great consulting work in China too, no matter what that climate is, it's still important as a business to keep those interchanged. And also, how do you take like this global workforce and then say, no, we're going to start isolating? And I know that we're doing that to an extent, right? But I don't know how much longevity there is in that. What if we were to flip that narrative? What if we were to start to influence as talent leaders? Look, this is what our organizations need to survive. I mean, things like immigration, right? If we aren't if we aren't immigrating people right now to the Midwest, we are not going to be able to meet this fifty two billion dollar goal of chip manufacturing. Because if, if we don't have immigration, how are we going to be able to fill these positions? Right. 
So I, I think from a business perspective, using our our the power that comes from American business to say, we need to keep expanding. We need to find a way to communicate. We need to make sure that we're including all of our customers. I mean, I don't think you can shut it down, right? You can't say, okay, no more iPhones, right? Apple's not going to do iPhones anywhere, but in the US, I mean, that's, that's craziness, right? So I don't think you can like put Pandora's box back in, into there. And I think that business has a lot to say about that. Um, but some of the hacks that we have coming up on that is that you will see that there are certain um, different types of local politics that actually AI is helping make it easier for us as talent acquisition people to voice those concerns and bring that up, especially coming into an election year on what are the things as far as immigration and visas and expanding into global markets and, and how do we make that effective? So hopefully, we'll start to have a bigger influence than we do now. I think the last number that I saw on that with any effective, and, and again, corporations are are very cautious to say, you know, we want to see an expansion in Asia or we want to see uh, an expansion in South America because of the stigmas that could come with those. But I think we've got to kind of put our big girl panties on and start to say, look, this is really what needs to be done, especially when we're at critical mass like that. You know, and even your when even the company that you're trying to take business from is saying, I can't expand in the U.S., right? The Taiwan Semiconductor Company, I can't expand in the U.S. because I can't hire enough. So now I'm going to bring people from Taiwan to show you how to hire. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I uh, just explain that they're saying they bring folks from Taiwan to show us how to hire in the U.S. Taiwan Semiconductor has pushed back the proposed start of production at the Arizona plant, citing a lack of construction workers with the expertise to install highly technical equipment. The firm plans to send staff to the Taiwanese facilities to train local workers to get them there. That was on their last earnings call. This is a pretty good article. It was in Fortune if you want to take a look at that. I'm going to read that. I haven't read that yet. Listen, it it touches on a point about development, right? So you think about how you engage employees, you know, if we think about the frontline worker and frontline workers in our manufacturing um, footprint has always been important to us as an organization. Two thirds of our employees are manufacturing workers. So uh, it's not that our frontline workers have never, has not, you know, we, we, they have been very important to us to this date and they continue to be important. But with us struggling to find, you know, skills trade individuals, we've started, you know, there's more pressure on the HR organization to start developing that internally have even broader networks and, and, and relationships with technical colleges. So what you're touching on a little bit there is about where the skills don't exist. And I could tell you, it's tough for us to find frontline workers. It's even tougher to find skills trade individuals. So, you know, it's a strategy of, you know, fine tuning where we would find these folks and, you know, playing a little bit of the pricing game with salaries and, you know, making our uh, employee value proposition more attractive. But that is a zero sum game in itself, right? I think, um, you know, that nobody's going to win that by just, you know, trying to outprice and outpay. You know, the market moves. And, and we are thinking very differently about how we fast track, um, you know, the skills trade positions. And that's not different from my African experience, to be honest, because they're also, you've traditionally had, um, you know, a, 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 a skills deficit, right? And, you know, you can see companies have very different uh, talent management strategies around, you know, internal um, training centers, which is actually where I did start my career uh, in 94, um, you know, was around how we develop locally. And I think that is sort of moving over to the U.S. You know, there is just not, especially on the specialized skills, uh, we're struggling to fill, you know, our, our skills trade roles. And, um, you know, that was uh, no different from the employment experience in, in Africa, I could tell you. Uh, it's also a scarce skill, skill over there. And I, I've got, not to pitch people's clients, so I'm pitching people's clients right now. The, um, that's a, uh, two things. Justin's asked me to make sure, just you want to tell the audience how they can make comments and ask questions. Absolutely. So we love to have these webinars be interactive with our attendees. Definitely encourage you to use the Q&A chat to pop in any questions that you have or comments and feedback. As we move along the webinar, I'll keep track of those and we'll make sure we get them answered before we finish today. Awesome. And I just realized you have the continuum behind you, right, Jess? Yes. So nobody ever calls us and says, you know, recruiting's going really well. You want to take it over for us on the RPO side. 
and you know that we were founded really on the consulting side like you know our mainstay has been how do we help create well-oiled talent acquisition functions for organizations which led to rpo and led to our technology the continuum see this little hannah moving behind jess she actually has it as her screen love that that's up there jess can you just put a link to the continuum in there so this is the recruiting continuum and when you're suffering and, and having difficulty hiring this has been our secret sauce. So to give you an idea, as of our um, quarterly reviews for last month, we are 22% ahead in fill rates. And none of the clients that we have are easy fills. There just aren't, right? I mean, nobody calls us to do that. Uh, so this is our consulting clients that are using the continuum as their cornerstone to follow suit and also in the RPO world. Uh, and, you know, I've had people say to me, why does, not necessarily just people, why do, why do RPOs, you know, do a better job sometimes. Part of that is that our own, the talent acquisition profession, and those of you who've been following me know that I have, doesn't have enough business acumen. We don't have enough talent. There's no degree in recruiting. There's no degree in talent acquisition. Uh, we're just finally starting to get there in the HR space, right? So um, really understanding what your organization needs from a business perspective and translating that into how you acquire talent and then using really good tiny metrics to make realistic decisions. I can't tell you how many times we'll come in to an organization and say, well, we need to make 200 hires in this space. They all have to sit in this area, you know, in this one location, and that's the way it's going to be. And then we take all of our information together and we say, okay, here's here's how we're going to get there and here, here's how quickly we're going to get there. And there's other times we have to come back and say, that's not going to happen in this geography. Here's the geography it might happen. And making realistic business decisions as compared to this resounding story of just fill the jobs. And you, you would never start a company and say, we're going to make widgets, just make widgets, right? You would have a really good plan. You'd have smart people that know how to make widgets. And you'd fund them and you'd support them. And everybody would be behind making widgets. So if we all agree, and globally at this point, we all agree, people are our biggest asset, AI or not. That's where we need to put the business acumen. That's what we need to fund, and that's what we need to pay attention to. So, I mean, I could go on and on. That, yeah, for a I, I that real first and foremost is where we do it. I'm yeah, sorry. And, and I, I'm just saying, I just want to echo that because I have some real world experience where perhaps a location was decided on factors, you know, around cost and, you know, uh, proximity of the, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the customer or the, the customer in our case. Um, and, you know, the voice of uh, of the HR organization or our talent availability was perhaps not heard as loudly. And I can tell you, we've spent lots of effort and lots of dollars to find people on that and continue to. And, uh, you know, it is an important factor around skills availability and, you know, uh, Maybe at the time we didn't uh, we didn't uh, express our case uh, well enough, but uh, you know we we're we're living that reality right now in some of the you know a particular location where we're really finding it challenging, um, you know to uh, to employ and uh, uh, and find the skills we need. You know it's interesting too because even with all these real world things going on, business is still kind of stuck in when's the recession coming? Well, me, I mean, the recession's been coming for three years now. I don't know where it is. So personally, I think it's pretty good that we're going like this instead of like this, yeah. right? But we're so addicted to up, down, up, down, up, down, which when it comes to people means higher layoff, higher layoff, higher layoff. So here is all these factors. Here's the agreement that people are it. Here's how we want to treat people. But we're still saying, and case in point, you know, I, was, I was talking to our team earlier, we have um, coming through Q2, we're talking to different clients that are saying, we're going to lay off because we had a bad Q2. And I'm like, okay, so you just spent X amount of dollars to make these hires. And now we're going to go in and we're going to lay off. When, what's Q3 going to look like? Because we're like almost at that midpoint. Like, why are we repeating this when we are living this? And I think there's so many of these factors that really attribute to change. But in the HR world and the people world, this is what we have to keep vocalizing to the C-suite. We're the ones that have to institute that change. 
I could talk all day about that too. So we do need to move to the employer employee power shift. Um, the Wall Street Journal, which, you know, I like to think that I study the Bureau of Labor Statistics really well. But one thing that I haven't looked at in a long time is who, what are the age brackets of the people coming into the workforce? Because going back many years, like even 20 years ago, there, because of the baby boomers exiting the workforce, that prime working age of um, age 25 to 54, I think it is, yeah, 25 to 54, um, have been leaving the workforce and we haven't seen them coming back. I, I Kudos to Wall Street Journal because I did read an article um, where they brought to light that for the first time since I think 1987, we are seeing an increase in that age bracket of 25 to 54 returning to the workforce. I think that's because it's a new world of work. I mean, you've got to at least be curious. So, you know, the example I like to give is there was a guy who delivered our DoorDash and it, there were two people at the door and it was a husband and wife team. They were retired. They decided to go back to work and deliver DoorDash because they could make a couple extra bucks and they were sitting around watching TV, right? So that might be one thing. But at the other point, uh, there's so many different opportunities that are out there. And the dialogue between prospective hiring companies and prospective candidates is changing, right? So I think that we're becoming more welcoming and maybe we're hearing voices better or they're at least interested. But that is that is a pretty interesting stat that I think I'm definitely going to keep looking at. Have you seen an impact in, in your group with 25 to 54 year olds at all? Um, listen, I think it goes back. It goes back to that stat I was using about if everybody was employed, there'd still be 4 million um, open roles. You know, I think we're used to certainly in, in my experience, more a reality where um, there are less jobs available and higher unemployment. Um, and certainly, uh, the unofficial unemployment rate in South Africa when I was there just before I left about 10 years ago was around 50%. So you are in an environment where, you know, uh, intrinsically, um, there would be more power in the hands of the employer because there's less jobs. And, you know, in that case, uh, I think you're more likely to settle as an unemployed individual. And you just talk about the economy, uh, economics of that. Um, but I think there's, as I say, foundationally that plays a very big role in people have choice now right and you're talking about your DoorDash, and that made me think of uh i took an uber to the airport to go to the conference where i met you actually uh and uh, i was talking to the interview i always love uh even in my time uh, in israel the, talking to the taxi drivers uh, you really get some really great great stories and, and sort of local cultural context. And I was talking to this individual who used to be a petrochemical engineer, and he now flies, he has his own private plane. And his wife said to him, was like, well, you have to find fund this hobby. You have to, you know, find a job. And he, when he's not flying the plane now in, in retirement, he's driving Uber, right? So he has the flexibility, the choice. He can drive the car at particular the time that he wants. Um, I think he told me he enjoys it because of the people he meets, so there's some value, and you know he appreciates that experience. But as somebody with over twenty thousand uh, rides and you know a rating of four point nine eight, something uh, you know really high, um, and that's I think what we're faced now with now is people have choice, and I think that just that just shifts things a little bit and balances the power in a way, right? And uh, I don't think I've been used to, and certainly in my experience, to an uh, an economy or a, a labor market where that was the case. Right? We had traditionally seen, you know, less jobs, more people, and um, at the same time, you know, you start looking at the people that's that's you know, coming into the workforce. They are way more diverse, much more educated. So the employees that we have to appeal to also are a lot less homogenous than what we're used to, right? So we start talking about, um, you know, inclusion, which is a topic here, right? And 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 uh, uh, attractiveness from an employer perspective is I think, you know, you take all, put all the politics and, you know, all the, you know, narrative aside, you know, the workforce that we're competing for is more diverse and they have much more broader set of needs, uh, there's a there's very different things that engages them in many ways, um, and that's a different reality, I think, right? Than uh, much of many of us are are used to. And uh, listen, you either adapt or 
you have a much smaller labor force that you are are going after and you know that there are some competitive disadvantages around that of course um just for me is uh, some of the things i've seen i couldn't agree more and i will say this too i think the misnomer out there is that i have to change who i am as an organization to pick up the woke generation I have to change who I am so that I can attract more of that 25 to 54 people. I've never seen that be extremely successful, especially in large organizations. But if you've got a company with 100,000 employees, and now you're going to be, and you're used to being finance driven and focused on the bottom line, and the expectation is that you're, you know, you do, most people are in house, you work nine to five at least, um, working overtime is appreciated. You know, there's really happy workers in those organizations. And there's organizations that are very successful that way. But I think the misnomer is that being bringing the balance in place is going to necessarily change who you are as an organization. And one of the biggest fall downs I think we see is when an organization makes the proclamation that we're now this. We're now kinder, friendlier, more open. And you can't possibly get, what? 40,000 managers on board with that who've been living in a different area. And then the biggest fall down part of that is that we'll see people that are hired that can't work in that atmosphere, right? There is a job for every person and a person for every job. If you, for example, if you work at people science and you're used to carrot and stick, you're not going to last here because we don't like that. That's not how we manage, right? But we've worked with organizations that are carrot and stick and the kind of people they employ do well in a carrot and stick environment. Thoughts around. Thoughts around that. Sorry, still getting over this. Um, listen, it's easier said than done, by the way. And you know, I think about it. Um, how to make that stick and how to make that work successfully? You know, is something that you know we ask questions about every day right because um you know we talk about work from home and you know in the office and you know we have a lot of considerations on, around um uh, preserving our culture right because as a, as an organization you know i my experience working here is this is the biggest small company i've ever worked for um because our culture are very much around maintaining that entrepreneurship decision making um, you know, uh, throughout the organization, speed and execution, doing work that's directly linked to the organization's uh, bottom line. And, you know, financial uh, acumen is one of the things we're really proud of. And I think um, many of our employees know exactly how their work contributes to the success of the company. So, you know, we've seen um, a big shift in the amount of uh, you know new people at the organization and a lot of people that joined from COVID onwards, right, about 40%. And uh, how do you preserve that culture and maintain that secret, secret sauce? So that's something we, you know, we're trying to figure out in many ways as well, right? And then still provide the flexibility, you know, around hybrid schedule, schedules, et cetera, uh, you know, move forward around the inclusion uh, DEIB um, journey that we're on. It's, uh, you know, it's easier said than done, but we have to crack this code if we want to be successful and continue to be successful as a company. But I think one of the resounding themes about Church and Dwight that came through in our conversations is you know who you are. Yeah. Right. You, you do know who you are innately as an organization. You didn't say to me, this is who we are as an organization. But as, as I've gotten to know you, I've gotten to know kind of what it's like to work at Church and Dwight. I know a little bit about your culture. Culture is a thing that's innate, too. So when you say this, we need to change our culture, we need to be different. That's like taking a family system, taking it all apart, making it work again. You can do it, but it takes time. And I think in the new world of work, really understanding who you are as an employer and then talking to candidates who really understand what they want. Where do they perform the best? You know, do they need a heavy handed manager to make sure that they're working? Do they need these really tight guidelines or are they better working at lib? It's been really interesting, especially with some of the newer people joining our organization that are at newer to their careers that are saying, I need more guidance. I need more um, protocols set up. So, but where it's successful, right, is when you get who you are as an organization and when you understand that's the kind of candidate that you want. It, it's always amazing to me, like when someone is unemployed, you know, I've been reading this, I've been reading a lot on LinkedIn, of course, 
I put out 100 resumes. I made, uh, you know, 200 contacts. And this is where I am. I want to give you a hack to this that I thought was really interesting. Nolan Church is a former recruiter at Google and DoorDash. The comment that Nolan made, um, and Nolan, I, I don't think you're on the call, but I want to give you a shout out. I should have given you a shout out on LinkedIn for that. But what he said, Nolan said is, if you're an applicant, contact the CEO. It is a different world, right? The C-suite is looking at things differently. So Jessica's interested at a position at DoorDash, and it's project engineer. And she's applied. She's not getting anywhere. Or she's had an interview or whatever the case is. She sends a note to the CEO saying, this is why I'm interested in DoorDash. This is why I want to work for you. What are the chances that the CEO is going to say, Jessica's a loser? Forget Jessica. I mean, a few years ago, if you're applying for a job, you're always one down. We need to capitalize in this new world of work that the C-suite is paying attention. And many hiring managers are getting it. And so they are saying, taking Jessica's resume and sending it to the right person to get them in front. And that's helpful for everybody. Because as things are evolving, even if Jeff doesn't have every one of the qualifications, based on the new world of work, we're talking about skills-based interviews, right? We're moving away from how many years experience and tell me what you can do. What is it that you bring to the table? And these new technologies that are out there, and please don't confuse assessment technologies Again, giving Jess an assessment to see how good she is as a project manager to a skills assessment or what are the qualities, traits, and abilities that Jess has. And if we put her in, there's actually really good AI out there right now that allows you to sit in the seat and do the job for a few hours, which then demonstrates what to you and to the employer, whether or not you would be a good fit. And I think anybody in TA who's not paying attention to some of these really cool skill, their skill assessment. They're not the same as doing like a behavioral assessment or an iAcuity test or, some, or something along those lines. But those could be big game changers, especially at the entry level. Okay. And there's a direct correlation between the people that you uplift by giving an opportunity. I call them give me a shot people. Direct correlation between their loyalty and their stickiness with the company. So I see that is a huge win. Are you guys using anything like that or considering any skill assessment or even to the audience? Is anybody yeah, using we're, skill we're, assessment? Yeah, we're at the behavioral, you know, at the behavioral level. That's not something we've explored too much. But I could tell you, you know, some of the highest uh, success rates, um, you know, I've seen of, you know, traditional in-basket type of simulations. And the big reason why companies don't do that is because just the investment of time and people that needs to you know, create those simulations and, you know, uh, be assessors and be trained to be assessors. It just not is, has never been economically, you know, feasible to do in a large scale, right? So we've, I've, I've done that, um, you know, very particular projects in the past where we've designed a whole in-basket of, you know, simulations. And we've always seen the best results and the, you know, you call it stickiness, uh, making the best hiring decisions around that. Now, um, I know I saw a presentation about from a company that uses AI to do that, and it's a whole simulation. Um, that takes away the cost of doing it, right? The only thing to think about, though, is, you know, we see a direct correlation um, between speed of the interview process, the number of interviews, and the outcome is folks who just design their selection process um, that, you know, the you know, keeping the candidate experience in mind, right? Because you don't want to have this lengthy thing, an assessment after assessment, another discussion after another discussion. So just in designing your process there and the tools that you use to make the best possible decision, think about candidate experience. Think about uh, how quickly that happens. Because another one I saw was was great. Um, it uses AI, you know, and you, know, you get permission to do the recording of the interview and it takes notes, right, automatically and does an automatic assessment versus the job description, bias free, and say, hey, you know, here's the interview questions that it posts you to ask, and then it does this assessment versus the requirements of the job, and you know, it takes all the bias out of the process and does just, so there's a lot of tools out there that is available, um, you know, just, just keep candidate experience in mind. I mean, you know, we've seen a, a lot more success where the process is a lot quicker, where when you have a captive audience that you can move the candidate through the different phases as quickly as possible. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the key. You don't want to lose them in the meantime. The idea is 
to be opening the field, not not shutting it down. And then, you know, there's there's that balance again that we have to keep taking into consideration. And I know we're coming up on time and I want to make sure that we talk about, okay, here's here's where we're kind of on opposite sides of the fence, right? Work from home versus remote work. Some of these dads. I mean, first up, caution, again, you got to look at where these are coming from. But there's also some really good um, things that are coming out, like that, you know, that grab for people that are coming back into the market between the ages of 25 and 54. Um, and the, the most recent that I, I saw is comes from the Greenhouse Candidate Experience Report, tag team with the Federal Reserve Survey of Household Economics and Unispace Returning to Work Report. And here's the, here's some of the stats about work from home. 42% of companies with return to office mandates had a higher level of attrition than expected. 29% of those organizations are saying they're struggling to recruit. 76% of employees stand ready to jump ship if their companies decide to pull the plug on flexible work schedules, including hybrid, right? So not just in the household time. 22% of these individuals that are saying they'll jump are from underrepresented group, protected class. Interesting. At the same time, the um, there was a study done by MIT and UCLA that said that there's an 18% loss in productivity with people who work from home. That number kind of circulated and went viral everywhere. So I did some deep diving into that. And they they used a poll of 230 some data entry workers in India to determine that. So again, caution to what you're hearing and what you're saying. First off, I'm not sure that we all know how to judge productivity because if you're not collecting productivity, how are you measuring it? Like, is everyone collecting productivity? Um, and second, I don't know, is 18% loss in productivity bad for data entry? I don't know. And India is not the same as China or the U.S. or South America. So, you know, understanding where the sources come from. But looking at the three quadruple, I think is interesting. I, I'm surprised that this 42% with the office mandates are, are, are saying they're having a higher level of attrition, where the conference board data is saying across the board that um, retention rates are way, way, way up. So there's so much conflicting data that you've got to get centered on who you are yourself. And again, not be, you know, pulled around by every win. The conference board, of course, you know, those are large organizations that belong to that. It's, you know, arguably 1,500, 200 employees that they use. I mean, I also think that they do come at it from the perspective of individual organizations. But that's a pretty big number. So they're saying 67% of employees are um, sticky and staying and happier than they've ever been before as well. Has that been your experience? I think your employees are happier now? Well, we did see, um, you know, we did change uh, engagement platforms. We did a statistical analysis, which is never perfect, right? We did see a, a bump in, uh, you know, loss engagement survey to this one. So just from a, um, from a data perspective, you know, that would suggest our employees are more engaged. Um, but it's interesting, and of course, this is how it could be our whole discussion just by itself, Christina. I don't think we were in opposite parts of the uh, the piece here. Maybe you're just, uh, you know, sitting there. I just threw it. No way, uh, you know, that's right, that's fine. Um, the challenge we experienced during COVID is people didn't know when to turn off, right, and to shut down. And we especially saw that at leadership levels in the organization. And then the burnout started becoming a real issue for us, right? So we did not experience productivity losses um, and it was really incredible, you know, our adoption of the tools that's available um, overnight. It's the quickest adoption I've ever seen of a major transformative way of working. Um, you know, and, you know, we're we're using one of the, the major uh, U.S. technology firms, uh, which I think many people would know. I won't be giving that a plug here. But um, overnight, people were on there. We're using it for meetings, video meetings. And the adoption was was super quick. People didn't know how to manage their time that way, right? Because there's things we do in the office, and we started experiencing burnout and you know uh, mental health concerns, et cetera, with a lot of our employees. So productivity isn't as much the issue for us as us asking 
you know, how do we preserve who we are as a company, what our identity is, right? Um, you know, we had some discussions around the reasons people are, you know, bringing back back to the, you know, full-time in the office mandates around real estate ownership, et cetera. Um, we believe in a hybrid schedule. And in fact, we've, you know, at least, I think roughly 25% of our roles, give or take, has become fully remote, right? And, and we've made that decision based on the, the role and what is expected. So for those roles where um, we need interaction, creativity, problem solving, you know, we've made those hybrid roles where we've had the roles that are more linear, um, you know, um, I sort of say uh, uh, output type of roles, which, you know, interaction, creativity, problem solving isn't as as big of a request. We were been more open to having those being remote. So I probably have the majority of my team now, and, you know, I'm responsible for a talent acquisition payroll uh, you know, our Ask HR or our, our service center, data analytics and, and, and uh, for HRIS and uh, HR optimization is remote. And it's interesting because, you know, I worked for many years in South Africa uh, for American companies where I was the only HR person. My team was sitting all over the world in different places. So for me, that puts a burden on me as a leader or how to be inclusive and, you know, bringing the people along um, and making sure it's still one team. You know, I don't treat people that come into the office different than those that don't. And, you know, when we have uh, team building events, how do we create team building events that includes people that's remote or, um, you know, it's it, it's just become much more challenging. Again, a lot, lot less homogenous than even the way we work. Um, for me as a leader, right, to be a truly inclusive and and and, and managing a productive team. But, um, you know, I think hybrid is the way forward. There are some things around creativity and uh, just these spontaneous interactions, which makes me more productive, keeps me connected to the core of what the company is. But at the same time, there are some things that I just don't want anybody knocking on my door that I can just crunch out and like focus. And my home office is perfect for that. So finding the right balance between the pieces of work that I could do focus time versus those that I can do better interacting, I think in my view is uh, the way forward. Well, and I think what I meant by that conversation and, you know, we can send this out if you don't mind. You sent me a great video about the founding of GPS. Right. Oh, yeah. Like where did GPS come from and how that was a brain, collective brainstorm. My dad happened to be the head engineer of the Apollo, Apollo 11, and oh. they brought him back for Apollo 13, like from Lisbon, those cell phones. Like that team really solved some big problems collectively and had to be in the same room. At the same time, I would say, you know, meeting you and getting to know you as an individual is different than getting to know you through Zoom. So. I wonder all the time, because we are now fully remote. People have had an office in the West Coast and the East Coast. Now we're fully remote since COVID. I can't get anybody to go back in the office. I can't get people to live five minutes from here. right? And when we do do that, it's kind of awkward. Um, I think that technology is really going to have to help find a way to help all of us, whether it's virtual reality or not. Like, how do we not lose that genius that comes out of great discussions and being together? Because I still think being in person is so important. But how do you time that? Okay, Wednesday's a good day for us all to be in person. Oh, let's all be genius on Wednesday. I mean, you know, I don't think we have a solution for that. What I don't, and I think one of the questions, Jeff, I jumped the gun and looked at one of the questions that was out there, you know, where do I see this going? I, I don't see organizations going back to what they did before, no matter who they are. I think the game has changed. Hybrid's the word that we use. How do you define that? What does office space look like? There are some there are some concerns I think that I have looking at some of the stats that have come out from the C suite saying we want to go back in half because we own these properties, which as a business owner I can tell you yeah that's important but I don't think my staff cares if I say yeah we're, we're paying forty thousand dollars a month for that office space so I want you to go to it is not an answer right um, and I think we're still stuck at that like there's some organizations still stuck because they own a vast amount of real estate right so and how is that you know there, there's a lot of again. This is a topic, we only have a minute or so left, but this is a topic that we could go on and on for. We should. You should come back. We should have you come back, Johan. Because I just love our conversations. We didn't really even touch on some of the things that I think can bring some value. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you found some value in it. Jess, anything that we need to answer before Johan does his closing statement and we talk about next month? 
Um, no, I went through most of the questions and responded back to them. Someone did bring up a really interesting viewpoint on the candidate that reached out to the CEO that had applied for the job. They said, you know, maybe this person had some sense of entitlement. Their concern is underserved populations, so people of color, lower socioeconomic backgrounds that might have been taught to follow the rules in order to get what they need. They may be less likely to feel entitled enough to reach out to someone and go around the established process. So I thought that was an interesting uh, viewpoint as well. Which is why I brought it up. Mm -hmm. New world, new world, everything is transparent. I mean, if you want to talk to somebody, you just have to message them on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. right? If you want to get somebody's email address, it's like, you know, you need a, a short tool, but you can get a free tool that can do that for you. That is the new world of work. So even better if you feel one down or underserved for that reason. Yeah. Johan, anything in closing? In closing? No, well, listen, um, I think it's an exciting time to be in HR, right? Not only um is the sec thinking very differently about public disclosures and 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 doing some work around what we have to disclose around people and our knowledge workers and the uh, you know intellectual property that walks around every day in in you know either remotely or in the offices but you know as employees of organizations um it's also uh, you know we got some some pretty big things to uh, to figure out right because uh, you know we've uh, We've accelerated a lot of change very quickly, uh, you know, through what had happened in COVID. But I think that's what makes it really cool to be in HR. It's like it's become much more important, much more meaningful. And you know, we saw during COVID that if you don't have the people, uh, you can't you can't do what you do as a company. So I am incredibly encouraged and thankful in many ways that I have all these really complex um, issues to solve and I have to worry less about the right language and emails and you know what uh, presentation pictures and the fonts and the layouts and I can spend my time um, you know problem solving and you know I just think uh, we should all feel incredibly lucky that we get to go through this really transform transformative uh, phase of HR it's like I'm super excited about that and and listen we got some work to do to figure this out we do and we're at that fork in the road I know it's not easy it's not easy for my company. It's not easy for our teams to try and, and figure and decode these things and position our clients appropriately. It's not easy with what the press says. It's not easy getting through the C-suite. And I do want to give a shout out to people in diversity and inclusion. I know you might feel pretty beat up. You made a lot of headway last year. It's a slow go. Don't bail. Don't bail. We need you more than ever. You made good progress. That's going to be one of the topics that we're going to, it's not dead in the water, even though I'm hearing from a lot of people you feel that way. And to all our HR friends, keep coming back. We have to keep talking. We have to keep vocalizing these things and we have to keep uplifting and helping each other create ROI strategies and get that to the front, to the front of the organization. So thank you very much. Our next um, webinar is scheduled right now for Wednesday, September 13th. Same time, noon Eastern. We'll have some great speakers on again. And again, our new format is going to be much like what you saw today. If you have anything you want to hear about or anything you want to talk about, or if you want to join us in a webinar, just give us a shout. You can always find me. I'm not that hard to get. Thank you, Jessica. Johan, as always, love seeing you. Uh, we'll do lunch real soon. And again, we'll have you back soon, too. Right. Thank well, you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thank for everybody, for, for listening. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.